Edo Arctic 2, Polar Research for Education, innovative program in Poland and Norway. Webinars. This uh, seminar, um, which is called, uh, it's part of, uh, of a series called Animal Invasion, uh, and we are focusing today on the Greylag Goose. My name is uh, Jo Orset. I sit in Tromsø in the north of Norway, and uh, I've had uh, several seminars uh, in this Edu Arctic uh, 2 series. Today I will talk about uh, the Greylag Goose, which you might have seen, um, because uh, in uh, Norwegian wintertime it overwinters in uh, Europe, different parts of Europe, mainly Spain and France. Uh, in uh, around 1970, 1972, uh, the Greylag goose was um, uh, not close to extin extinction, but it was not a lot of them in Norway. Uh, but after, uh, well, in the late 70s and early 80s, uh, the um, amount of Greylag goose, the populations uh, were increasing. Uh, all over Europe, and the part of this population which uh, uh, migrate to Norway to uh, to nest and to eat during the summer uh, were increasing more and more. And in the late last 10 years, 15, maybe 20 years, uh, the um, amount of geese have exploded. And it's impossible to know exactly how many there are in Norway because the coastal line of Norway is uh, enormous and there is uh, a lot of islands, small, uh, uh, small islands, big islands. Uh, the shoreline is, uh, I think if you stretch it out, the Norwegian shoreline, um, you go one or two times around the equator. So it's an extremely long uh, shoreline and the, the Greylag uh, goose likes to um, um, reproduce along the coast. So we will never know how many uh, there are. Uh, but um, um, what is happening now is that they are starting to eat uh, more and more on the farmer's field instead of in uh, natural pasture or natural uh, rain, uh, rangeland. Uh, and that has become a problem. Um, that has become a problem because the grey leg uh, goose is a vegetarian. It eats only plants and maybe berries. And it's uh, described uh, by many as a cow uh, with wings. Uh, and it's approximately three to four kilos and can eat one kilogram of grass every day. And one kilogram of grass is approximately two plastic bags uh, completely uh, full with grass. So the amount of grass they're eating um, is now so much from the farmer's field that they have problems, uh, economical problems actually, uh, because they need this grass for their own cows and sheep and husbandry uh, during the winter. So in this project, we decided to uh, monitor uh, when and how many and uh, where uh, the uh, greylag goose forage on the fields, uh, on a farm outside of Tromsø, 24 seven with uh, game cameras. So here you can see some pictures. Here's the greylag goose. Here's the game camera put up on the field. Here we are. Um, here we are uh, preparing for the for the uh, uh, pro uh, project. And when you do this, when you put out game cameras on the fields uh, on this island or on this farm, which is situated on an island, it's called Musvær. Uh, you have to uh, give notice that you are doing this, and you have to have. Uh, um, um, you the, the owner of the land have to agree to this. Uh, 
here is a picture from uh, uh, some gray lag uh, goose that are flying northwards. And this is from uh, the county of Trendelag, which is in the middle of Norway, approximately. And they are now on their way uh, northwards to, um, uh, to uh, reproduce. Uh, and uh, some of them, of course, will stop in uh, Trendelag as well because they, they nest all along, along the Norwegian coast. But in North Norway, there is maybe more, we don't know, but maybe more than uh, further south. And you can see also here that it's eating grass. This is uh, evidence for that. Uh, <clears throat> we try to count goose, and many uh, scientists in Norway try to count goose. Um, and it's most maybe uh, during the reproduce uh, reproductive season, it could be uh, best to do that because uh, they are uh, um, they cannot fly from their chicks. But the problem is that they are hiding very, very well. Uh, this is a photograph taken uh, from a boat uh, approximately two, three meters from uh, this small island. And uh, on this picture, you have two adult uh, grey lag uh, goose and uh, five chicks. And I'm not sure if you can see that. Maybe you can see one. Maybe you can see this one. Uh, but the two adults are uh, there. Yellow, yellow arrows, two adults, uh, because I've zoomed into the picture. And then the uh, chicks are situated here. So if you're going to count grey lag goose, uh, uh, goose uh, geese and, uh, and chicks, it's very, very difficult because they hide so very, very well. And also you can see that the adult uh, take down their long neck uh, to reduce the um, uh, posture of themselves. So they are very uh, go in goes into the uh, to the surroundings, so it's very difficult to count uh, geese, and um, that is why we will never know uh, how many uh, there are. Uh, as I said, uh, we um, uh, we uh, did the project at the farm uh, outside of uh, outside of Tromsø called Musvær, which is. Uh, where, where there is a lot of grey lag uh, geese, which uh, nests during the summer, and uh, they have big problems. And I will show you now uh, a video uh, filmed from a drone uh, of this uh, uh, farm. Uh, and also it will show you a little bit on how farms in Norway actually can be situated. Uh, this is uh, a farm uh, which is situated in a place where you will think that, is this possible? Is this possible to have a farm here? Uh, they deliver, for instance, uh, their milk from the goats, because they have a lot of goats, uh, with ferry uh, two times uh, a week. And this is kind of a place where to just show you how Norwegians uh, also can live along the coast, because Norwegians live along the, along the coast all over Norway. So this is a film. I don't have music on it, uh, so I will just tell you a little bit as the film goes on. The first uh, people that lived here were um, uh, has been tracked to eleventh um, hundred century. I have to turn off my virtual background. Uh, this is one field. So people have been living here since 11th hundred century. Uh, the text that comes down is only the names of the fields. And here we can see uh, rangelands, uh, rural areas where the geese will nest.
and you can see that uh, just straight out you have the open ocean and the next stop is Greenland. It's of course a very beautiful place um, where people have uh, been farming since the 1800th century. Here you can see the goats. The goats are uh, uh, foraging in the in the rangeland. They are put out every morning and taken in every evening. <clears throat> and uh, Tromsø is uh, situated back those mount behind those mountains. So to get here, you have to take uh, first uh, to drive with a car, and then you um, take a ferry takes approximately one and a half hours since uh, from leaving Tromsø until you are here. It's uh, 40 to 50 coral sand beaches here, uh, but of course uh, it's uh, very cold water, so it's not very nice to, to swim if you don't like that. Here is me, working, it's a hard working day. And there's the farm. <clears throat> there are two brothers. One brother lives here and the other brother lives here. They have uh, 165 uh, goats and some cows and some sheep and also chicken. And uh, the quality of the grass from this area is exceptional. Um, because the earth and the draination uh, from, the, from the soil is very good because of the um, sand. So they are completely dependent on the grass from these um, fields for their uh, animals. Here is the um, where the ferry comes. And it's of course a place where you have uh, extreme uh, weather uh, contrasts. You can have uh, very, very nice summer days and you can have extremely high winds and snow and it's a very tough place to, um, to run a farm. <clears throat> so this is of course a very, very attractive place for the greylag uh, goose because uh, of the green grass. They are uh, vegetarians. Uh, they are vegetarians and, uh, and when the grass is so of such high quality and high energy and uh, situated so densely, uh, then of course uh, the geese will go down and eat there. Uh, so the background and what we have done from earlier studies on Musweil is to show that the grey leg geese can eat 35 to 46 percent of the grass on the fields if they are allowed to forage freely. Uh, they can leave up to 100 kilograms of droppings per uh, 100 square meters. And uh, estimated crop damage, what this will cost the farmers, is approximately 7,000 euros per field per season. Uh, because if you're going to replace the grass that you have lost to the, to the geese, you have to buy dry grass. And uh, dry grass is a uh, little bit more expensive, and you have to also to um, transport it out to Muslat. Um, because uh, goats are ruminants and they need uh, grass, it's the best for their ruminant digestive system. Uh, gives them uh, motility in the digestive system, so it will work well, and also it gives them the most energy. Uh, we have performed, and also the brothers on Musvan have performed uh, so-called lethal scaring. Uh, lethal scaring is um, something that you can do outside of the hunting season if an animal or a species is doing damage to your uh, property. Uh, that means actually that you are allowed to shoot uh, some animals to scare them away, in this case from the fields. And you don't have to shoot a lot of them. Uh, in the first place, it is a lot of grey leg uh, geese there. Approximately the few times we have counted, uh, maybe 400. 
Uh, we're not sure, as, as I told you the reason for that, but um, um, if you shoot approximately 15 to 20 uh, geese every season, then you're actually, uh, um, uh, you reduce or stop the crop damage completely because the grey lag is, is a very intelligent animal, uh, bird. It doesn't take a lot of uh, lethal scaring activity. Uh, before they completely uh, will view the field as a dangerous area, I will not go down to eat there anymore. Because uh, the thing is that uh, it's a lot of uh, food to eat uh, in the uh, in the rangeland around the fields, but they will all all animals will always take the most easiest uh, way, and that is actually to go down on the field because the amount of food is so very, very dense uh, there. So we also, on this, in this project, looked at, uh, looked at how lethal scaring would uh, uh, prevent um, uh, crop damage. And uh, in this, uh, we had, of course, game cameras, so we could see everything uh, in this project. So, <clears throat> background for this study, when during the day and season is the pasture pressure, uh, also uh, the, um, the, when the grey lag geese is eating, uh, from uh, grey lag geese, uh, the highest. Does the grey lag uh, forage in the rangeland all season, or does it uh, choose to uh, eat in the rangeland only when the berries are uh, ready, for instance? We didn't know that. Uh, and how effective is lethal scaring for preventing crop damage from geese? And the goal is to pinpoint any protective measures. It could be also uh, other protective measures than lethal scaring. Uh, but to pinpoint this uh, against crop damage during the season, to know exactly when is it uh, most important to uh, put in and do an effort and use resources uh, on protective measures. The problem here on Musvær is that approximately 45 other bird species are nesting. So you cannot use uh, gun cannons, uh, no, loud, uh, uh, sorry, sound cannons, which someone use. You cannot use a laser, which other farms use, because then you will scare away uh, the other um, species as well. And we cannot use dogs to scare uh, the grey lag geese away because that will um, uh, affect all the other species. So lethal scaring is here the only method which can be done which will only affect the grey lag geese and not other species. So that's important to say. So in this project, a total of 54,000 pictures were taking, uh, taken by the game cameras and uh, we put them on time-lapse. I will show you that now. Uh, first, some uh, grey lag geese numbers. Here is a picture of uh, a field uh, packed with uh, grey lag geese. Uh, it is taken uh, uh, the 4th of August at uh, 10 uh, 49 in the, uh, in the morning. And you can also see the temperature here and uh, the humidity. And this is from camera 14. So we had approximately 19, uh, not approximately, we had 19 cameras uh, put out. And some fields had three cameras and other fields had four cameras. Uh, to cover the whole field was important. So some grey lag is numbers from this uh, counting from the game cameras. Uh, there were 1,678 visits or landings in total from grey lag geese. The highest number of grey lag in one day on one field was 1,234 individuals. That was 18th of August. I will tell you soon why it happened in August. The highest number of grey lag uh, in one visit, one landing, uh, was 120 individuals, 17th of August. Interesting observations. Uh, because when you are counting so many pictures, 
when you're going through so many pictures, you see some interesting trends. Uh, so you have to actually do that by, uh, you have to do that yourself. You, you cannot use, a, for instance, a computer program to, uh, to count this for you, because that's possible. Uh, you need to observe every picture and, and take some conclusions of what's happening here. And what we saw that uh, it, when, when I did that was a lot of interesting things. For instance, when you come, when you are coming, the gray leg uh, will leave the field, it will fly, uh, but are back on the field two to four hours after, only when the locals pass. So when local farmers go out to check the field, the geese will fly, but they will be back two to four hours later because they know that these uh, two guys are the locals. They are not dangerous. Um, if there are foreign people uh, that uh, passes the field, uh, the gray leg will of course leave the field again, uh, but they are back uh, only nine to 16 hours after. And that is indicating that they know that these people are foreign, they might be dangerous, uh, and we should be away from the field uh, a longer period. That's interesting. Uh, newly hatched uh, chicks are introduced to foraging on the field, but only on distant fields where access to the sea is short. I will show you pictures of this soon, but the newly hatched chicks, very small chicks, are introduced to the field by uh, the parents and they start eating grass uh, as, as soon as they are hatched. We saw that eagles hunt the chicks on the fields. And we saw also that all geese uh, forage on the fields, even though it is covered in 10 centimeters of snow. Because in Tromsø, it could snow in May, and it did uh, this year. It, uh, it was snowing in May, and uh, the geese just went down. They shuffled away the snow, and they uh, uh, ate uh, the grass and seeds in the, in the soil. Uh, and the grey leg geese, of course, also forage on the fields when it's pitch dark. Uh, that's it in late August. Because in Tromsø, during the summer, uh, you have continuous light. So the darkness is, or the sun is going below the horizon uh, in um, August again. Also, you have barnacle geese here. Uh, they are um, um, landing on Musvær uh, on their way to Svalbard because they don't nest on Musvær. They nest on Svalbard. So they are uh, migrating to Svalbard and they land here to eat, uh, to get energy for the uh, trip to Svalbard. So uh, the uh, barnacle geese, they are not here very long, uh, but they are in huge numbers as well and also will do some damage uh, to the fields. And the numbers of uh, barnacle geese, this you can see is taken um, 19th of May. Uh, and they are now, uh, very soon, will leave the island for, uh, for Svalbard. Uh, barnacle geese numbers, uh, highest number in one day, uh, 495 individuals. That was 15th of May. Total visits, 246, only in April and May, because they have left the island in May. Uh, highest number in one visit, one landing, was 102 individuals, 14th of May. And this um, uh, migrating uh, barnacle geese, there were approximately 100 individuals staying here at Musvær for, well, three weeks maybe, and before they left for Svalbard. Then we had some pink-footed uh, geese also here. Uh, this is taken 17th of May. Uh, they were here very short before they uh, went to Svalbard. Uh, highest number in one day, 260 individuals. 16th of May. Total visits, 54, only in May. And highest number in one visit was 43 individuals. So, uh, method. How could we actually um, measure uh, 
and how do we present uh, the pasture pressure to, to have a number on uh, how many geese there are and what kind of pasture pressure uh, the field was experienced, how much crop damage is done to the field at this moment. So to do that, uh, we put up uh, game cameras. You can see here a satellite photo of um, uh, one field. And we, on this field, we had four game cameras indicated by this red, which covered uh, their own zone of the field. Uh, and then uh, we had, uh, as I mentioned, 19 game cameras all together. This is one field. Uh, we had four game cameras here. Uh, and these game cameras, every game camera took one picture per hour every 24 hours a day from April to August. And if you times, time this with 19, you get approximately 54,000 pictures. They were put on time-lapse and time-lapse is uh, just a function of the camera. Uh, so it takes no matter uh, if there are uh, any animals there or not, or someone is going past or not, it will take one picture every hour during the 24 hours in one day. Uh, in addition, the game cameras will take a picture if it detects a motion in front of the camera up to 25 meters approximately. So you also have these pictures. You have pictures from the time lapse, 24 a day, and then you have activity pictures uh, in addition. The number of geese <coughs> that we counted uh, from each camera um, is put together with the uh, number from all these cameras on one field uh, to give you one number of geese per hour, per day, per field. So when one camera was counted at, let's say, six uh, o'clock in the morning, uh, that number was put together with the six o'clock numbers from all other cameras. And then you got one number from the whole field. This will, of course, um, always be a minimum, minimum number because there could be geese that you don't see, but uh, not many. So when we uh, present pasture pressure, we express this in goose hours. Uh, and goose hour is actually, it's very simple. The more goose hours you have on a field, uh, the more uh, crop damage has been done. Uh, there has been a lot uh, more um, uh, foraging by geese that day, uh, and the pasture pressure is therefore higher. So <clears throat> then we take the number of geese per day, per field, in one field, and we time this, uh, we, we um, multiply this with the number of pictures with geese on, divided by 24. Let's take an example. You have 600 geese on one field, one day. Uh, <clears throat> present on all together, 12 pictures. So you have uh, geese present on 12 of the 24 pictures that day. So then you have 12 divided by 24, which is 0 0.5, and you times it, you, you multiply this with number of geese that day, which was 600, and then you get 300 goose hours that day on that field. So uh, if you had had uh, 600 geese uh, present in all of the pictures, 24. Um, pictures a day, uh, meaning that there are geese on every picture every hour of the day, then of course the goose hours would be 600, meaning that this indicates more pressure on the field than 300, of course. And <laughs> there's a lot of numbers when you do this. And this is just a small uh, clip of the Excel sheet um, that uh, I was working on and counting. And um, uh, here is the date that we put all together down there, and then you have the hours here, and then you, you list up the numbers, and then you do some calculations to, to get the total number. It's a lot of work. Uh, 
I will show you now some pictures from the game cameras. Um, this is from 17th of August. Um, and you can see here that they are going around eating. Here is another picture. Uh, after this, uh, one of the farmers came uh, walking to the field. So that's why they are leaving the field here. Here is an interesting picture. Up here, you see an eagle and it's flying over the field and the geese will immediately leave uh, the field because the geese uh, is a very good flyer. It's very quick, but it has a very straight line when it flies. It cannot fly back and forth and up and down. It has a very straight line. So if they're not leaving the field uh, very early, there could be an easy catch for the eagle. This is a picture showing you uh, a mother, maybe, uh, and her chicks, uh, five chicks, and we were actually following, I think it was the same five chicks, and they were all adult. Uh, they were visiting this field every morning. And this is 12th of June, uh, 6.41 in the morning. Uh, this picture, uh, 26th of June, shows you uh, chicks in different age. Here you have uh, some big chicks, but not adults. They cannot fly. Over here you have very small chicks. And here you have uh, intermediate size chicks. Uh, also indicating that um, the reproduction of the grey lag geese at Muslar is very spread. You have someone that starts and, and lay their eggs very early in the season. And you have some that lay their eggs later in the season. So that's also interesting to, to note this. Here you can see a, a grey lag goose forging on, uh, on uh, when it has been snowing. This is 25th uh, of April. Also here, a uh, very interesting picture. Uh, there is also an eagle coming in here. Uh, they are now fleeing the field uh, because the chicks are a very easy catch for the, for the eagle. And of course, we had some problems with the goats. I have to admit that uh, they were very interested in the game cameras as all, all goats are interested in everything. And this is uh, uh, the criminal that has uh, taken down my game camera. Uh, so I had to go out and put them up uh, several times, uh, actually. So, so they were not that also destroyed one game camera. This is a picture to show you. Uh, this is actually a very nice uh, night. It's uh, 1.36 in the, uh, uh, during the night, uh, 6th of August. Uh, you have a very nice moonlight, so it's a nice picture. That's why I show this. But you can see the geese coming down on the field in the middle of the night to eat. And this is, of course, a period of the day where the farmer is sleeping, so the farmer could not uh, do anything about that. So that's, a, of course, also a problem. They, they forage uh, at certain times of day where it's not, well, you have to stay awake to, to scare them away. Okay, let's see a little bit on the results. Uh, <clears throat> at Greylag first. Uh, here you have the goose hours on the uh, y-axis, as I showed you, uh, explained to you uh, just now. And then you have the time uh, of uh, time in months on the x-axis, April. This is in Norwegian, April, May, June, July, and August. Pretty similar. Uh, on this uh, graph, uh, it has uh, that is calculated from a field where you did not have any lethal scary. And you can see that uh, there is a lot of, uh, well, we have approximately top is 200 goose hours one day, but the goose hours are high almost every day, except for July. And that is, uh, there's no geese on the fields in July. And that is because they molt at in July. They change their flying feathers and they cannot fly. And then they will stay on, uh, on the water. They will stay, uh, um, 
uh, they cannot fly, so they will only swim around and maybe go ashore on small islands and eat, but they will not visit the, the field. We knew that from before, but it's interesting to have it 100% uh, uh, documented. And then in August, you have very high numbers, up to 400 goose hours. And that is because all the chicks uh, this year, uh, the population has increased after the reproduction, uh, reproductive season in June. Uh, and uh, well, May, June, and then you have more geese coming to eat on the fields in the beginning of August. And the uh, very instant they can fly again, the adults can fly and the chicks can fly, they will come back on the field. Well, on the right hand side, you have uh, the same graph, but from a field that we had lethal scaring. And you can see that they started to visit the field and to eat in the end of April. Then the lethal scaring was initiated in this period and then they completely disappeared. You had some small visits here, but that's not a problem if you look at crop damage. So lethal scaring completely removed uh, the amount of geese and then goose, uh, goose hours um, on the fields. Uh, if we look at uh, grey lag in the rangeland uh, outside the fields, we had a problem in July when I was on holiday. And as I showed you, the, uh, the goats uh, took down the, the game camera. So we have only, uh, this season, we have only numbers up to uh, end of June or beginning of July. Uh, but you can see that they are eating in the uh, rangeland. Um, now you can see a picture with two geese here. It's very difficult to count these pictures because they are very difficult to see. It's much more easy to see them on the field. So you had to zoom in on any detail in the picture and, and count. It took a lot of time. But you can see that during April, May and June, they are uh, eating, well, regu regularly uh, in the rangeland. If we look at uh, when do uh, the grey lag eat during one day, then we took um, and divided the day into four hour intervals from midnight to four in the morning, four in the morning to eight in the morning and so on. Uh, and we counted the percentage of total visit that day uh, in these different hours intervals. And then you can see that you have most visits on the field uh, between um, four uh, o'clock in the night and eight o'clock in the morning, a period of the day when you have, um, well, people are sleeping, uh, the farmers are sleeping, so they cannot do anything. So almost 27% of the visits were in this period. And this goes down during the day. Uh, for the barnacle geese, uh, you see that, uh, oh, sorry, <clears throat> for the barnacle geese, uh, you can see that they will arrive, they arrive in the uh, beginning of May, and uh, they are eating uh, uh, a lot, actually, uh, well, a lot, it uh, depends a little bit uh, on uh, where, um, where they, uh, how many they are, uh, they could spread out on different fields and you had only 100 geese approximately. So they eat um, uh, in May and then they leave for, uh, for Svalbard. The pink-footed uh, geese were only here uh, maybe five days, six days, maybe one week, I don't remember, and they uh, uh, ate a lot in this period uh, before they left for Svalbard. So they ate very concentrated uh, in a short period while the uh, barnacle geese uh, spread out their eating a little bit more. That's why the goose hours are so concentrated and high uh, for the pink-footed uh, geese in, uh, in May. If we look at chicks, which we counted on the, on the field, uh, the number of chicks on the y-axis and the time in months uh, on the x-axis, you can see that they start to appear on the field in the beginning of, of June. And then uh, you have a huge uh, increase in uh, the end of June, beginning of July, before they disappear. 
uh, and then you don't have uh, the uh, big top in August as you had for adults. And that's a very simple reason for that. Uh, the simple reason is that from game cameras uh, pictures, it's very difficult to see if it is an adult geese or if it is a yearly chick because they are now so big and they can fly. So you have to have a very close up picture to see if it's a chick or not. That's why uh, I cannot be 100% sure that it's a, it's a chick born this year or hatched this year. So that's why we just have to count a geese, not uh, say a chick. So, but of course it will be a, a lot more uh, chicks in August, uh, of course. So, uh, well, I had to conclude a little bit. So the <coughs> conclusions uh, from this study shows that lethal scaring is very effective to prevent crop damage from grey leg geese. Uh, and then you have to conduct lethal scaring approximately every fourth day. And the farmers cannot do that. So uh, you have to recruit hunters uh, that helps them. Uh, in the end of June, uh, I will go back to, to show you. In the end of June, um, there's a, or in whole of June actually, but especially in the end of June, you have a lot of eating because they need a lot of energy uh, before they are molting in July, changing their flying feathers. Uh, so in this period, in June, it's especially important to uh, put uh, your effort into preventive measures. Also, in the beginning of August, it's very important to put uh, in preventive measures to keep down the crop damage because then you have also the, the chicks eating on the field, so you have more animals, more, more geese. Uh, but this graph shows you, and that was very steady for all the fields, we, we looked at five fields. Um, if you conduct little scaring, you get uh, a picture or a graph like that the crop damage is completely gone. And as uh, also have told you, we saw a lot of interesting biological observations uh, that uh, we have, uh, well, increased our knowledge on how the grey leg geese, uh, especially which nests on Muswer, uh, what they do during the season. And uh, this will help the farmers uh, to uh, get extra help during these critical periods uh, of the uh, growing season uh, because uh, some of these fields have been so so uh, um, damaged by geese that you cannot uh, give this grass as food for the husbandry for instance it could be too uh, too many droppings um, yes so um this was what I was going to tell you, and I put out a picture of my cat to uh, because I was a little bit tired of goose when I uh, was, had counted 54,000 pictures. So thank you for your attention, and I will take uh, questions. Watch other recordings from webinars on our YouTube channel, youtubecom edoarctic EduArctic 2, from polar research to scientific passion, innovative nature education in Poland and Norway receives a grant of 240,000 euros received from Iceland, Liechtenstein and Norway under EEA funds.